Galatians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, 3, 1 through 3, amen. The book of Galatians is uh, attributed to uh, the Apostle Paul. He has uh, written this letter to the church in Galatia. It is one of the uh, cities in the region, obviously, of the Roman Empire, uh, a particularly uh, vibrant space and place where there's always, if you read these letters to the epistles, letters to the church uh, from the Apostle Paul, he's trying to talk not to an individual church, but to a collective. He is attempting to help them wrestle with what does it mean to live in community, uh, but also to live with tension, with challenges, with controversy. And the Apostle Paul, who, uh, if you know his journey and his story, uh, was one of the early uh, followers of Jesus who had to come to Jesus the hard way. Uh, he was not one of these folks who uh, heard the gospel message and just gladly accepted it the first time. Uh, the Apostle Paul had to go through some, 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 some close encounters with uh, the Most High to help him change his mind, to help him appreciate that there is a proximal space to God, that God uh, is willing to go some extra lengths to get uh, us into right relationship with him. How many can bear witness that over the course of your life, God has gone through some extra lengths to get your attention? Anybody? Anybody? Amen. I'm not saying God necessarily knocked you off a horse. Amen. But he knocked you off your high horse. Amen. God, 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 God gave you a radical interruption. I wish I could talk to somebody in here today about a radical interruption. Can you just look through the rear view mirror of your life at all the times God had to snatch us to get our attention? Mm. Maybe it wasn't God. Maybe it was just your bad choices. Maybe it was just some struggles you had. And in the midst of all of your struggles and your challenges, God inhabited that space that your challenge created and got your attention. Do I have any witnesses up in here today that God got my attention? God got my attention through some things that the devil meant for my evil. God got my attention through a blessing I did not anticipate. God figured out a way to grab a hold to my attention. And I'm so grateful. And so the Apostle Paul had to get uh, that radical interruption, if you will, and that radical interruption literally put the Apostle Paul into a leadership role in the church at a time when Paul was actually persecuting the church. And Paul's ministry, particularly to those who were not considered Jews at the time, became a pathway for so many uh, in history, if you will, to find a message of the gospel that spoke to their particular context. Now, throughout Paul's life and his journey and his ministry, he had to deal with some self-righteous folk, some folk that were a bit upset with Paul's rendering of the gospel. And some of those folks were some folks who were a little bit more conservative, not conservative necessarily like our uh, political conservative uh, description, but conservative meaning they were attempting to conserve the status quo, the old way, the more kind of fundamentalist, legalistic descriptions of the Jewish faith. And Paul ran up against some of these conservatives as Paul was attempting to expand the presentation of the gospel of Jesus to folks outside the Jewish context. And so what we're reading here in this particular passage is the kind of tension that was arising between two groups of people who were indeed somewhat committed to following the gospel message of Jesus, but were uh, finding themselves overwhelmed with particular prejudices, prejudices, ceases, prejudices biases, prejudices, and biases. Touch your neighbor. Y'all pray for Pastor Mike. A little jet lag this morning. The brain is catching up. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what you find and what we find is that uh, it reminds us painfully. Lord, it's so painful for me to say it because, you know, I'm one of these people who 
who believe some of these folk that claim to be Christian, they just can't be so. But this passage is reminding me that you can be following Jesus and still be deceived in the way you follow Jesus, which is good news for those and us who are deceived because it always leaves a pathway to a more perfect and faithful gospel. Galatians chapter number three, verse one through four. We'll read it uh, in our hearing. And I don't know. Oh, they do. They found the slides. Somebody say amen. Amen. You know, uh, I just want to appreciate our our team. You know, when 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 we, we plan our week for service and then you wake up and electricity is out and the and the and the internet is down and the and and the fuses is 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 just blowing in the building and they still figure out a way to keep all this stuff going. Let's clap our hands and thank God for our audiovisual team. All right, Galatians chapter 3, uh, it says, you foolish Galatians. So again, Paul is writing to the Galatian church, and he is, he is kind of chastising them. He's saying, who has bewitched you? If you read the King James Version, it'll add that you should believe a lie. I don't know why they left it out of this translation, but that makes it even more damning, right? Who has bewitched you? Who has tricked you? Who has lied to you that you should believe a lie? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. The one only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Having started with the spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing? It, if it really was for nothing. Well, then, verse number five. Well, then, does God supply you with the spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the topic today, Stop Lying to Me. This is part two of an ongoing series that we are going to work through for the next uh, couple of weeks here, even on the other side of the election. You ought to tell your neighbor, stop lying to me today. Please stop lying. Okay, I know y'all didn't like that. They meant, so just man, talk, out, talk out there to the people who's telling lies. Somebody holler, stop lying to me. God bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts that we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Stop lying to me. This has been and continues to be, particularly during election season and cycles, a reminder to us that the world is controlled by very powerful storytellers. People who have the ability and the power to shape our realities through narrative, through particular kinds of descriptions. And if you and I are not careful and cognizant, we will become people formed by external sources and narratives that are uh, unconscious to us and yet are acting and working in ways that produce a particular kind of outcome. What we know and what we understand, particularly in the age of social media, and now social media has built these algorithms that have now even emerged to artificial intelligence on a whole nother level. That you can even right now clone people's voices, if you will. You can build programs and voice imitators and, and you can manipulate uh, uh, images and create uh, a reality that is not grounded in truth. That's not grounded in facts. That's not even grounded in history in that did this even really happen? There are those who wake up every day to feed and to fuel misinformation, disinformation, to continue to push upon 
us in the population of our country and even in our subgroups, information that erodes your humanity, that calls into question your imago dei, the imprint, the divine reflection that God has placed within us. I want you to know, beloved, that in this political season, it is an opportunity for us to be aware of the devil's devices, not just politically, but also in our daily life. Because there are people in your daily life who 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 are 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 dependent upon you buying into their lies, even about you, buying into falsehoods, buying into uh, uh, partial truths, buying into narratives that intend to cause you to question your confidence, to question your competence. There's a word called gaslighting. Anybody heard of that word, gaslighting? How many know that uh, Donald Trump, he's a gaslighter, but he ain't the only one? How many know you got a gaslighter on your job? Somebody say amen. You got a gaslighter, Lord help you, if it's in your house. Lord, help us today. You got a gaslighter on your block. You got a gaslighter at the coffee shop. There's a lot of folks who want to feed lies to you and make you believe that you are the crazy one. That you are the one, when you challenge them on their lie, that all of a sudden you are being aggressive. You are being confrontational. You are the one who is doing an act of violence. Anybody ever been gaslit that way? Someone just, you know, telling you something that you know is not true. And when you raise it, they're like, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm being attacked. I told them, yeah, you attacked me with that lie. Somebody say amen. And now I'm not attacking you with the truth. I'm just telling you the truth because you bound up in a lie. It is important for us to appreciate that there are a lot of lies being told about our children. A lot of lies being told about our community. A lot of lies being told about your possibility, about your capacity. There's a lot of lies being told about who God believes you to be. A lot of lies being told about what you can do and who you can be. But I believe when we ground ourselves in the truth of what God says about us, then it opens up the possibility for what we can be in the world. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God says some good things about me. God says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. God says that I can do all things through Christ. That somebody ought to say hallelujah. God says that even when my enemies come against me, I can win. And so when God is speaking the truth in my ear, how many know the whispers of the enemy, the lies that come, are to consistently be drowned out by God's truth. And the truth of God is always seeking to undergird us, to strengthen us, to give us a moral compass. So we can navigate through the lies. The lies that come in your spirit, the lies that come in your mind, the lies that come in your house, the lies that come from the school, the lies that come from the news, the lies that come from the streets. God wants you to be able to tell the devil whenever the devil's lying, stop lying to me. Because I know the truth of who. Not only God is, but what God requires of me. You see, when we go to the text, you find that the Galatians are people that Paul had first preached to. Isn't it interesting that Paul goes out of his way to go to the land of Galatia to help spread this new uh, message of Jesus resurrection, this message of Jesus crucifixion, this, re this message of Jesus acting in miraculous ways and, and subverting systems and structures and Paul is, 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 is preaching these messages and then you got some people who aren't comfortable with Paul's gospel following up behind Paul, you know Paul may have said, oh you know I'm in Galatians today I'm going to go to Ephesus and then somebody comes in behind Paul 
and starts to tell the Galatian followers, listen, Paul gave a good message, but in order for you to really be a follower of Jesus, you need to buy into our fundamentalist message of circumcision. Now, I want you to know, beloved, just in case you don't know, that the act of circumcision was one of the hallmark distinguishing practices that Jewish uh, boys had to engage in by a certain kind of date in their uh, youth, and, and it, 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 it removed the foreskin from uh, their private uh, genitalia as a way to mark them, but some also thought it was a way for them to also have you know, some health uh, benefits, if you will. We take it for granted because circumcision is a major practice in the Western uh, kind of culture and context, but you know, back then, if you were Jewish, you engaged in circumcision, but if you weren't Jewish, you did not. So one of the interesting things that became quite a challenge is as Paul is preaching to the Galatians about this new gospel message, uh, many of them were not circumcised. And circumcision and uncircumcision became a very huge culture war issue, if you will, among the Galatians and others who were not Jewish. So Paul's message was saying, listen, You do not need to engage in circumcision to follow Jesus. But then you had Jewish Christians who were saying, hey, you need to keep following the Jewish laws. If you were an adult male and had to go through circumcision, you was going to have a hard time. (laughs) I just want you to know. Amen. I don't remember my circumcision. I was too young. Amen. But if I, I, I'm sure I cried even as a baby because I'm sure it didn't feel good. Can you imagine a 30, 40, 50 year old man during uh, 30 AD, 35 AD, 40 AD having to go through circumcision as a prerequisite to follow Jesus? <laughs> Some of these brothers would have been like, well, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep worshiping the pagans. Praise God. This, this, this too high of a cost. Somebody say amen. But there were Jewish followers of Jesus who could not uncouple their cultural preferences from the liberatory message of Jesus. And Paul comes in and he he says to the Galatians, listen, I only been gone for a few months. Who has tricked you? That you should believe this lie that the Grace of God is bound up in your cultural practices. Paul says you have diminished the magnanimity of grace. You have diminished the magnificence of salvation to a cultural practice. And Paul says that is a lie. So the first point, beloved, that I need us to wrestle with is you and I must be knowledgeable that first there are people who want to deceive us and reduce our faith to things that our faith, listen, is too big to fit in one person's box. First thing you got to do is reject deception. Somebody holler, reject deception. There are people who are constantly and continuously attempting to try and cause you and I to reduce our faith to things that are clearly outside of the 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 fullness, the 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 comprehensive message of the gospel. And you and I must be able to discern and ask ourselves who is trying to. To bewitch you. Now, you know, I, I, I don't want to get too, you know, isogetical. I don't want to get too, you know, uh, 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 liberal and generous with the text. But, but this word bewitched is a fascinating word. Because it speaks to powers. It speaks to forces. It speaks to stimuli. And it also speaks to some kind of transcendent or otherworldly kind of catalyst. How many of you know that there's a lot of forces in the world today that are seeking to deceive us? Seeking to deceive our children. Lots of things that are causing us, particularly through social media, to even uh, turn inward to ourselves. And hate what God has created. I 
am so cognizant of the way in which social media has 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 literally grabbed the minds and the imaginations of our young people, of our children, all kind of research that says that the more social media our children consume, the more depressed they are. The more self uh, 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 harm they engage in, the more they 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 fixate on the parts of their bodies and and their 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 features that may not live up to some kind of of European standard of beauty. They think their nose is too big. They think their hair is too short or textured. They think that they don't have uh, the proportional sizes of body parts. Why? Because social media has bewitched them. How many of you know that we have to, as parents and as leaders and as adults, begin to call into question the forces of social media that too often are bewitching our children, that are causing them to believe a lie about themselves? I was watching an old school clip of Lil' Kim and Genuine on 106 and Park. It popped up into my feed. I don't know why it popped up into my feed. Maybe it was the Holy Ghost giving us a good sermon uh, example. <laughs> and I remember Lil' Kim, how Lil' Kim looked before she started to engage in all of the surgeries that now today make her almost unrecognizable. And when you look back at Lil' Kim, you know, I wasn't a big, you know, kind of, you know, hip-hop dude back then. You know, so, you know, she always kind of was pressing the envelope for me. So I never really, like, really tripped off how beautiful Lil' Kim was. Lil' Kim was a cool little round-the-way sister girl. I grew up with a whole bunch of round-the-way girls, you know, just homies from the neighborhood. You know, just good-looking black girls, you know what I'm saying? without all the extra features and all, all this kind of manipulation of bodies and et cetera. And it just caused me to think about how dangerous a lie being told to us over and over again will cause us to chase something that is false. And how many of you know when you keep chasing a falsehood, you'll never arrive at the destination? And that chase will change you. It'll change me. It'll change us from who God created us to be. We must reject deception. Somebody holler reject deception. <clears throat> we must reject deception and hold close to the truth. But how many of you know there are beautiful lies out here? There are ugly truths out here. And for many of us, we'd rather believe a beautiful lie than an ugly truth. But I love this author of uh, 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 African proverb. We don't even know who wrote it. But it says, love the truth even when it hurts you. And reject a lie even when it helps you. Oh, I, I, I love this quote. Love the truth even when it hurts you. Reject a lie even when it helps you. How many of you know that for many of us, we must hold fast to the truth? And I want you to know, beloved, truth is knowable. Facts are real. There are things that change with more knowledge but the best information you have ought to be what you hold fast to. And in the text today, we find a very important truth that Paul is attempting to speak to them. And I believe this same truth has traveled 2,000 years across time to speak to us today. Who is bewitching us? I mentioned social media. Social media has become a carrier for falsehoods that have had real world consequences. I've talked about young people. How many of you know over one million people died during COVID? And one of the reasons why is because social media carried true, carried falsehoods that became an epidemic 
of lives that lies that cost people their life. How many of you know a lie will kill you if you internalize it? A lie will cause you to think that you aren't qualified. And so you won't apply to that job. A lie will make you think you're not smart enough so you won't uh, launch that business. A lie will make you think that you and your family can't make it so you'll run away. A lie will make you do all kinds of things rather than standing ten toes down on the truth. I'm here to tell you, beloved, reject deception. Reject it. Check the sources and I want to remind you like I said last week that there is a father of lies there is someone who is consistently creating distortions trying to get you to believe something that is not true so what is the question what 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 are we what are we trying to think about today first question I would ask you what kinds of deception are at work among you what beautiful lies and ugly truths must you wrestle with within yourself how many can be honest and say there's some things i gotta look inward about and i gotta start rejecting some things that have been told about me and mine about my family about my neighborhood about my people about even this country there are some lies that i must reject and it's obvious, I hope today, that we got this election coming up. It's a great opportunity to reject a lie. Reject a lie called Donald Trump. Reject a lie called Make America Great Again. Reject a lie called Project 2025. Reject a lie called fascism. Reject a lie called authoritarianism. This is an opportunity to reject a lie. There's some folk who want to accept a, a beautiful lie. Why? Because it helps their tax bracket. But I heard Jesus says, what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Some will accept a, a beautiful lie that says in order for the United States to be great again, we must have the lethal uh, military that, that has budgets that, that dwarf the social safety net that holds our country together and serves the poor. I want you to know that that lie must be rejected by both Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. I'm voting for Kamala Harris, believe me, but people got it twisted. I'm voting for Kamala Harris because I choose her to be the one we organize against to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. I believe that she will have a more open door towards our accountable conversation. Somebody say amen. 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 And when we out there protesting, she won't unleash the military on our head. Somebody say amen. Amen. When we disagree, she won't put the alphabet uh, police on our heads. CIA, FBI, you know, DHS, home, all these. I believe that we are going to still have to push for justice. But there's a difference between a fascist and a neoliberal. We'll talk about that on the Bible study night. Somebody say amen. But we must reject lies. And deceptions and we must reject them in our own lives in our personal lives in our families in our relationships understand if you don't discern a lie and you internalize a lie it'll literally destroy everything the lie touches give your neighbor a high five and tell them reject deception reject deception reject deception uh let, 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 let me let, let me keep moving on here uh the the the, the text then goes on to to remind us that who has bewitched you that you should believe a lie? Then it tells us of in very plain circumstances that you and I must be wary of fundamentalism. I, I, I think I described it already. That you had some Jewish followers who were asking the, the, the kind of Gentile followers to subscribe to their very narrow description of personal conduct and behavior, cultural practices. Jesus called it the commandments of men. I want you to know, beloved, that the universe
universal gospel does not fixate on your cultural preferences. Now, clearly, I do believe that there's something about uh, the ability to be continuously transformed into the image of God through how we treat one another, through how we treat our bodies, through how we treat our neighbor, through how we steward creation. Yes, we all, while we're following Jesus, we're going to have moments where we need to take a leap. How many glad that you've taken a leap in your faith? Can anybody say the things I used to do? I don't do them no more. But how many of you know that your salvation was not bound up in the things that you used to do? And you're not doing them no more. Your salvation was bound up in what Jesus did. Whoo, you, you ought to be excited about that. I'm glad that while I'm learning the ways of Jesus, Jesus still extends salvation to me. I'm glad while I'm still figuring this thing out, Jesus still holds me and loves me and calls me his own. I'm glad while I'm struggling in my faith, the benefits of my faith still extend to me. I'm glad when I'm upset and I'm confused that God is not upset and confused. I'm glad that while I'm learning to follow Jesus, the process of learning transforms me into something more godly, into something more just, into something more loving. Fundamentalism does the exact opposite. Fundamentalism turns you and I into the exact opposite of God. Why? Because if God was a fundamentalist, how I many know all of us we have to get that circumcision? All of us would have to go through somebody else's litmus test. That is very arbitrary. I was speaking uh, to, to a, a group of evangelical pastors on Monday. You know, I stopped talking to a lot of evangelical pastors after the first Trump administration because I realized, uh, as my friend Freddie Haynes said, that most of the evangelical churches seem to be more white than they are Christian. So, you know, what would a black man have to say to some churches that can't even discern the gospel that way? I, I said, I, I'm going to have to give you over to God because I got to talk to some of my own people about how to make sure that they themselves follow Jesus through our own cultural context. But he wrote me into this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I was in, where was I at? I was in Houston you know, doing some voting work. And I was in my, I was in my hotel room. And as soon as I got on the call, I started to sweat. I said, why am I talking to these people? <laughs> some of them are my friends. And I just, the Lord have mercy. Because, you know, Pastor Mike's trying to be more mellow in my older age. <laughs> trying not to pick fights with folk that, you know, it ain't going to be no fair fight. Praise God. Because I told some of them, you keep talking to me, I'll make you question it all. Praise God. I, I, I can deconstruct your faith in a way, make you just wonder, what is it that I believe? But I'm not mean-spirited like that. So you stay over there, I stay over here, and I'm going to leave you to God. Anybody ever had to leave somebody to God? Say, you know, I, I, you know, this ain't even a fair fight. I'd be a bully if I really approached you like this. Hey, Amen. I'm just going to leave you to God. Because if I put my hands on you, if I, if I put my mind on you, huh, my intellect, my money, if I put it on you, you're going to be crippled. But I don't want to cripple you. I want to leave you to God. That's a word for somebody. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them leave him to God this week. Don't cripple them. <laughs> leave these people to God. You know they can't measure up with what God has placed in your hands. Leave them to God. Amen. That one I just preached to myself, but I didn't leave them to God that day. Somebody say amen. <laughs> no, I did. I was nice. Had a nice mellow voice. Nice steel, even keel tone. But I did tell them what kind of gospel, you know, I was just, you know, what kind of gospel? Where the Southern church pastors preaching to their members, where they could have a church full of folk in the morning singing how great thou art and amazing grace and then go out across the railroad tracks and lynch some black people in the afternoon see it makes me believe that the greatest indictment on Christian discipleship in the American church is the rise of Christian nationalism where we in the American church cannot discern the rise of an authoritarian leader right in our midst using tropes from our tradition to tickle the 
anxieties of members of our church to believe this election is about transgender people, to believe this election is about bathrooms and who's playing in sports games and that people are getting hormones pumped into them when they go to school, to make them believe this election is about teaching black history, to make them believe this election is about protecting America from the boogeyman out there when the boogeyman is really within our country. Who has bewitched you, brethren? Because you know most of them was guys. That we cannot see this imminent threat. You believe this election is about killing babies. How they talk. It's about gay men. You, you pulling all these culture war things out, not realizing, beloved, that we can have a theological, ethical conversation about all the issues you care about. But there is a leader that has bewitched your congregation member to the point, and I told him, I said, I believe we're in a pre-genocidal moment in our country where some of these political leaders may flip a switch on some of the members in our churches. And these individuals will believe they have a righteous obligation to attack people who are a threat to their way of life. Oh, you know, it was quiet in there, kind of like it's quiet in here. They didn't know what to do with what I said. I said, I hate to be a Debbie Downer. One of the pastors said, well, Pastor Mike, uh, what, what, what would you say to us who, who believe that we don't have the kind of influence we used to have with our members. I said, hey, join the club. <laughs> but does that change what you preach? Some of us need to leave church leaking with a little bit of spiritual fluids. You know, you ever got cut by somebody, not physically, but you know, literally, you're like, man, huh? I don't, think, I don't think that felt too good. How many know, okay, how, how many know there's a difference between a cut to take your life and a cut to save your life? Whew, Lord, help me in here today. How many know that sometimes in order for your life to be saved, you need a skilled technician with a very particular instrument who knows how to pierce parts of your body that are closed, but there's a thread in there, there's something happening in there, and because they're so skilled, they know how to get inside of you without harming the parts of you that are vital. And they can cut you, but guess what? They can what? Put you back together. Ooh, how many know that some of us need to ask God, Lord, help me to put my knives away that are intended to kill folk and take out these instruments that can literally help Repair parts without destroying the body. Fundamentalism is a knife that kills. The rigidity of fundamentalism creates no space for grace. It creates a radicalism. It creates a kind. I, I, I think I got another another quote up here uh, that about bamboo. What 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 what's the quote? What what's the next slide? The bamboo that bends is stronger than the oak that resists. Ooh, how many know some of us need to ask God? Give let my faith be like bamboo. I don't want to be someone who can't bend. who's so rigid that I can't create space for God. I'm a Pentecostal, and by extension, y'all Pentecostals, you just don't know it yet. Somebody say amen. <laughs> what does that mean? That means we believe the spirit can move. Woo, we believe the spirit moves in mysterious ways. How many God can, can be, be a witness that the spirit moved in my life in a way I can't fully put language to? I, 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 you know, they told me, you know, to say that the ABCs accept, believe, confess, but the spirit, hey amen, you know, sometimes, you know, did a little remix and I confessed before I believed. 
all right, accept it before I confess. How many know the Holy Spirit knows how to move and get into your life and your circumstance and your situation and turn you into a whole nother person without a formula, without the same kind of approach that God worked on me? God can work on you in a totally different way and get you to the same destination. Why? Because we Pentecostal. Somebody say amen. God knows how to use miracles to change your mind. God knows how to use powers to shift situations. God knows how to use circumstances in a way that will increase your faith and not destroy your faith. God knows what to do. And so I trust God. Somebody holler, I trust God. I trust God that God can do anything but fail. I trust God that God is able to lift my eyes to the hills and know my help comes from the Lord. I trust God that no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. I trust God that the lies will not work. I trust God that the lies will be defeated. I trust God that victory is mine. And that's why I can walk through the course of my life. You can say what you want, devil. Lie on me if you will, but I'm holding on to the truth. Uh, lie on me and say I can't make it. I know I'm going to make it uh, because God is with me. Uh, and if God is with me, he's war more than the world against me. Lie on us and say that we as a people will not make it. We've been making it thus far. Uh, and I don't believe God brought us this far to leave us. Lie on me and say that promotion is not mine. The the promotion does not come from the east or the west, but promotion comes from God. Lie on me and say my children will not be saved, but I know that the legacy of faith that comes from my great mama and them, and landed in my grandmama and them's lap, and landed in my father's lap, and landed in my lap, it will be transferred across my progeny. Lie and say that Donald Trump is going to win. Even if he wins, I believe that he's going to lose. Why? Because I'm going to pray the enemies to fail I reject lies and I and we will hold on to truth I believe in the truth of what God says about us that's why I can tell the devil stop lying to me I'm not going to I'm not going to be a, 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 a waste basket for your lies. You got to take that stuff somewhere else. And even listen, if the lie helps you, you got to reject it. There's things I don't agree with. With the Democratic Party, with Kamala Harris, with the Biden administration, with the Obama people. I don't agree with a lot of these folks. So you know what? I try to tell the truth where, whenever I'm with them. Sometimes they keep me out the room. I had one of the Obama people tell me, Pastor Mike, you know, there were a lot of meetings that we were having about racial justice and policing. And when we were putting our list together, your name would come up, and a conversation would go like this. Do we want Pastor Mike in this meeting because we know he's going to say something? <laughs> this, is what, this is what the staffers told me. We know he's going to say something that will push us and cause tension. Just had some meetings, we just had to leave you and some of your friends out of it. We knew some other people we bring to meeting, they're going to come in there and, you know, they're going to say whatever we want them to say. But we can't say that about you. The political campaign, you know, we've been trying to organize people. You know what they told us? Uh, we, can't, we can't coordinate with you, Pastor Mike, because, you know, you're still talking about Palestine. I said, well, I'm going to be talking about it now. I don't know what y'all talking about. You're talking about, you're talking about, you know, all the things that the Democratic Party don't do. Why would you give us your money? I said, because there's lots of people that don't agree with you. But we still going to try to defeat Donald Trump. And y'all forgive me, you know, uh, I, you know, I know we ain't supposed to be partisan, but, you know, extreme situations require desperate measures. That's right. That's right. We must defeat this wickedness. And whatever room you're in, whether it is your family, someone's got to have some tough conversations with your family. I've been talking to some of our brothers and the, the, the lies. Some of our brothers be spewing out here. A couple preachers got on TV this week. One of them called us preaching pimps. I said to myself, I had, I had to call one of his friends again on the Instagram live with me. I said, because maybe he'll hear better from you, because you know, I, I was gonna say it, you know, I was gonna say it mean things. 
righteous indignation mean things? You know, holy, can I, holy, righteous. <laughs> tell the truth. Tell it with humility. Tell it with love. Update it when you get better information. But buy the truth and don't sell it. Don't be a sellout for lies, beloved. In this moment, God is asking us to speak out for truth. Come on, let's stand to our feet and let's prepare to pray. <clears throat> Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind. See how great, how great. God, I pray for the person I'm touching today. God, this moment, this season, we need to be reminded that you're great that you're greatly to be praised, that you are greater than the lies, you're greater than the falsehood, you're greater than the misinformation, the disinformation that seeks to penetrate our psyche, that seeks to penetrate our spirit, that seeks to penetrate our heart, our family, our, our communities, this country, this world, our politics, our economics. God, you are great and we trust God that your greatness will carry the day. We know, God, that we are a people who depend totally on you. You are the source of all that we have, the source of all that we need. And so I pray for my beloved. I pray for the person I'm touching. I pray, God, that you will give to them what they need today, a glimpse of your glory, a jolt of your spirit, a clarity of this time. Lord God, so we can, in the next week and a half, in the next two weeks, in the next months, in the years to come, we can help guide our families, our communities, our church, our country away from systemic and structural wickedness. And God, we can lean into a liberatory way of life that makes sure our children can be all that we've imagined them to be through the power of your spirit. So God, I pray for my beloved today who has internalized some lies. They've internalized the lies of their abuser. They've internalized lies of their teachers, of, of their bosses, of, of their neighbors, of their family members. God, I pray today that they will have the boldness to tell the liar, stop lying to me. I am who God says I am. And I will do what God says I can do. And I will be what God says I can be. And so God, fill them, God, with the confidence, the holy confidence that comes from you, God. A confidence that reminds them that, Lord, there is nothing outside of possibilities if we have you right along with us squeeze their hand real gently i squeeze life into these hands i squeeze hope into these hands i squeeze salvation into these hands we say yes lord somebody say yes lord yes. come on say it again yes lord come on say it again yes lord we say yes to your will god we say yes to your way we say have your way in me god have your way in them have your way in us god have your way in jesus name now lift those hands to the lord god it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father, my sister, my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Come on, say it again. I need you, Lord. Come on, say it again. I need you, Lord. I need you, God, to guide my steps. I need you, God, to open up the doors that the enemy has tried to shut. I need you, God, to bring fire into my belly, God, so I can accomplish your ways. I need you, God, to save my soul. I need you to heal my body. I need you to touch my mind. I need you to trigger, Lord God, peace and, and love and serenity and happiness and contentment in me. I need you, God, to take fear away. I need you, God, to replace fear with faith, fear with hope, fear with love. And do it, God, as a way to bring you glory and praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, just take a few moments and just lift those hands to the Lord. And just trust and believe that God is greater. God is greater than your circumstance. God is greater than your challenges. God is greater than your disappointments. God is greater than your fears. God is greater. 
Then the lies being whispered in your ear. Then the lies making it into your algorithms. Then the lies being communicated through all these sources. God is greater. Hallelujah. And so we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for being great. Thank you for being our God. We love you, God. We love you, God. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. We magnify you, God. We give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give somebody a high five and tell them God is great. Come on, tell them God is great. 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 Clap your hands and bless the Lord, everybody. Come on. Clap your hands and bless the Lord. Clap your hands. We thank God. We thank God. We thank God. God bless you, people of the way. Listen, I pray that you have a week filled with joy and peace. I pray you have a week filled with purpose. I pray you have a week that keeps you reminding yourself that you are God's child, that you are God's property, that God is on your side, that truth is on your side. Maybe that's what we'll preach next week, the third part of the sermon. Truth is on my side. Ooh, how many glad truth is on your side today, amen? We love you with the love of the Lord. God bless you. I pray that you.